my whole name is Madhulika Guha Thakurta, and I go by Lika. And I have been at NASA for 30 years, so you can call me a veteran, NASA veteran. <laughs> and I have done a number of things while I have been at NASA. And right now, I'll tell you that um, my focus is really ut utilizing artificial intelligence and uh, sort of innovation in the intersection of science and technology. Heliophysics is the study of the physical domain defined by the sun, the heliosphere, very much like Astrophysics is the physical domain defined by stars, you know, which is the rest of the universe, very simply put. Now, remember the term heliosphere here, we refer to essentially that whole volume of space carved out of the Milky Way by our sun. And not just referring to solar wind, sometimes people get confused. Now, this physical domain includes the sun itself, of course, the solar system, and stretches out to the start of the interstellar medium and, you know, interstellar space where we have some of our spacecraft today, like Voyagers uh, 1 and 2. So, in, in principle, heliophysics studies everything inside the sun's domain. So this is kind of like a tongue in cheek response. Now, now let me kind of clarify a little bit more. So at NASA, for example, the region of the Earth's or other planets atmosphere that is clearly dominated by planetary effects, such as the troposphere is included within Earth or planetary science. Everything above, such as the mesosphere, thermosphere, ionosphere, they are all included within heliophysics. Why? Because solar effects, both magnetic or radiation, generally dominate this middle and upper atmospheric region. But again, there is no hard boundary between the Earth and heliosphere. Energetic particles, and electromagnetic fields from above, and then gravity waves from below, all interpenetrate the interface region between the physical domains of heliophysics and Earth or other planetary bodies, right? Which becomes planetary science. So understanding this interface region therefore involves both or many disciplines. Important point is that Although the term heliophysics may be new, the field itself is certainly not. In fact, heliophysics may be considered the oldest science discipline studied from space, something people don't know about, even predates uh, NASA. In 1958, the first US space satellite explorer one discovered the Van Allen radiation belts, a fundamental feature basically of planetary magnetospheres and a critical phenomenon for heliophysics. And I'll give you kind of a couple of other two important features for uh, the community to understand. Heliophysics is a term we made up to define this new discipline that's the connected science, science of sun, earth, sun, planet, sun, um, interplanetary medium. It is a unique hybrid between astrophysics, sun as a star, and meteorology, our planet's, uh, you know, uh, upper reaches of the atmosphere, ionosphere, magnetosphere that interacts with this. It is dominated by three forces. Two we know very well, which operates everywhere else, which is pressure and gravity. And in case of heliophysics, you have to add magnetic field. That's what makes the sun the sun and creates 
the conditions by the sun in which outer atmosphere we live in. <laughs> well, you, you know, heliophysics wasn't a discipline when I studied physics, astrophysics at the universities. I mean, the, the, the word heliophysics was adopted by NASA as the name for its division in 2005. So no, I, I did not get inspired by heliophysics domain. However, my fascination for astrophysics began as a, at a very young age uh, because I loved to stargaze. And basically that kind of ignited my curiosity about the cosmos. And I can tell you one of my earliest inspirations actually came from the idea that when people pass away, they become stars in the sky. You know, a notion sort of that, that captured my young imaginative mind and maybe spurred me to explore the mysteries of the universe uh, further. And then so this kind of continued, right? I used to pester my father, with questions that really have no answers. Where did the stars come from? Where did we come from? What's out there? What happens to us when we die? Now, my father was generally a patient man and he was, uh, uh, he, he, he never shut me out. He encouraged my curiosity and he played a pivotal role basically in nurturing this, you know, taking me to the planetarium, indulging my endless stream of questions. And, um, you know, back then for me, stars, learning about uh, comets, Saturn's ring, seeing them in planetarium shows was fascinating. But if I think about those precious moments from my childhood, I realized how they shaped my journey into astrophysics, right? Uh, father's encouragement were instrumental during those formative years. And I, I continued to kind of push these boundaries. I didn't pay much attention to, you know, observatories in India to go look at the stars through telescope. My fascination was really with science um, and more towards theoretical science, theoretical astrophysics rather than astronomy. And I was sort of, I was deeply interested in cosmology, metaphysics, and uh, exploring the profound fundamental aspects of the universe. And, you know, you can clearly see, you can dream away. That doesn't mean that you get to do what you think you want to do. So it, it wasn't until my master's program at the University of Delhi that I had the opportunity to delve into astrophysics. And, you know, there were many choices of programs, solid state physics, quantum physics. But of course, I had a special connection to astrophysics and cosmology. And then that kind of drew me into that, that area. And so, in a nutshell, to answer your question, you know, my journey into this world probably was shaped by a combination of personal experiences and a thirst for knowledge about the universe. Living with a star was formulated and funded by the US Congress as a new initiative in 2000. And I have to remind people that it's no longer a initiative, you know, that was funded with only $20 million in 2000. And our first mission launched in 2010. This is unheard of. You know, Congress funding something, right, an initiative where the mission doesn't launch. There is no hardware to show till 10 years later. And you're really kind of trying to shape a research idea, basically. And so Living with the Star is no longer an initiative. It's a full-fledged program. And the program is really quite unique in that its plan consists of big flight missions, supported targeted research and technology, 
which we lovingly called TRNT as opposed to science research and technology, which used to be called SRA back in the days and things kind of evolved. So we have targeted research and technology within the umbrella of living with the star science today. And so we had flight missions, we had very kind of focused research and we had small space environmental test space, which are like uh, orbital laboratories to develop new uh, LWS concepts in hardware, all with the objective of providing science with societal impact. This is unheard of in space science. or science, this is everyday routine, right? But who would ever think that studying a star, sun, would lead to societal benefits. And, you know, living with a star still remains unique within the space science component of our science, where it is science with relevance to societal impact. And so I became the first program scientist in 2001 with those, you know, precious $20 million and remained so through 2016 till I came to NASA Ames for a short stint at being a detailee there. What, what else does this program really do? So the program is highly interdisciplinary, you know, it, involving domains of study stretching not only the distance between sun and earth, sun and other planets, sun and the edge of our solar system, but also in varying scale from the size of atoms to the size of stars. It, 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 it's, it's really pretty, pretty complex. And then there is magnetic field, right? Sort of connecting all of this. So some of the science goals have, as I mentioned, direct societal implications. What are they? to understand, for example, the variability of cosmic rays and solar energetic particles, something we want to understand so that we can provide mitigation around it. And this information is uh, really crucial for astronauts for our long-term journey into deep space, like back to moon or going to Mars. We also try to understand sun, climate connection, you know, how solar electromagnetic radiation and particles influence, like I was telling before, the thermosphere, mesosphere, upper atmosphere, and even terrestrial climate. And I'm just giving you kind of the areas, right, that we study. Or to forecast conditions in Earth's radiation belts, you know, where spacecraft routinely travel, right? If you have to go to uh, moon, Mars, wherever, if you're launching into deep space, you have to absolutely go through uh, radiation belts. And, and then to understand the impact of space weather on Earth's upper atmosphere, right? Crucial for satellite safety, terrestrial navigation, such as uh, global positioning system, uh, communication system, or oh, it's, it's endless amount of varied signs. And now we are kind of taking all of this knowledge to other planets where we have observations in our solar system and sometimes now to the exoplanetary location, right? To determine if there is a life possible between a given um, stellar uh, source and the exoplanet by establishing sort of the habitable zone, not by liquid, uh, you know, water, but also by, by the space weather threat. So in that sense, you know, for the past 20 years, I have essentially steered the development of heliophysics, utilizing Living with the Star program as an integrated uh, sort of scientific discipline and, you know, from which lots of fundamental discoveries about our universe have come about, but they are providing direct benefits to society. So it is not curiosity-driven science alone. It is the intersection of curiosity-driven science that is relevant to life and society, kind of like the way Pasteur did his science. In this role, I have, you know, made possible many flagship missions, 
Solar Dynamics Observatory, still running right now, launched in 2010. Van Allen probes were launched in 2012. That radiation belt environment is um, really a very harsh environment. And so such spacecraft don't live for very long. So they are no longer in operation. Then we have Parker Solar Probe launched in 2018. And Parker Solar Probe is going to, you know, this is still a mission very close to my heart. This is the mission that's actually going to go within the closest distance, like nearly 10 solar radii from the center of the sun in December of this year. It, it's just mind boggling. Then we have Solar Orbiter mission, uh, which is a collaborative mission with European Space Agency that is actually propelling itself out of the ecliptic to really get a better view of the uh, poles. And then of course, my very first mission, which is not part of Living with a Star, was the stereo uh, probes, basically two twin spacecraft launched in 2006. We lost contact with one. The other one is still going around uh, the sun, which gave us the first sort of three-dimensional view of a solar storm. The first 360 view of, you know, really looking at what the sun is doing with the front side and the far side of the sun. And then, so th these are, you know, so basically these are missions, but in order to accelerate, accelerate basically your innovation and all that, I created funding mechanisms, which I was talking about earlier, right? Bringing different groups of domain scientists up, out of their comfort zone. And this is the first thing I did in the first 10 years of Living with the Star program. To, to address the system science, which I call the targeted research and technology with focused science team that foster competitive yet collaborative environments that promote the cross-pollination of science ideas and technology. And used you know, the program to kind of help create a name fellowship after Jack Eddy, uh, interdisciplinary scientist, in our field who you know, passed away in 2009. And, and this fellowship program has become an important channel for the professional growth of promising researchers um, and has been really successful also at promoting the careers of uh, many women scientists. So, you know, this is living with a star in a nutshell and there are new blood, new people actually managing all of this and creating more. It is a fact, uh, really appreciated by most people that to professional astronomers, the sun is a pretty boring star and they often get mad at the sun because it takes away, you know, half their observing time. <laughs> so, which in fact, is actually great news for the rest of us. You know, the, the, the sun, sun's boringness is good. It doesn't oscillate or explode periodically, you know, scorching us or freezing us out. You know, in all recorded history, uh, you know, sun's output has varied very little. And this is sort of, you know, we, when we see the visible spectrum largely, you know, sort of one one tenth of a person, and and I I say all this why? Because we are lucky. We are not the planet Trisolaris in Alpha Centauri in the three body problem, which has now been I think turned into a Netflix show. So imagine dealing with one temperamental sun, right, is bad enough already. Well, on Trisolaris, they have three suns. So we are lucky. We like that the sun is boring. So like all stars, pretty much, star, uh, you know, the um, sun is an enormous thermonuclear uh, furnace, you know, where a, a huge amount, million times, and don't quote me on these numbers. I'm just kind of throwing some of these things which are close enough. Uh, you know, so we have like 
um, in, at the core of the order of 15 million degrees um, temperature, 600 million tons of hydrogen that are fused into maybe 596 million tons of helium. So think about the missing mass, that missing four or whatever million tons are transformed into energy. That is our source of energy. They become sunshine. They are the mortgage payment for life on earth. That's kind of where we have to begin. And so even if there's a slight change in this precariously controlled kind of chaotic, I don't know, um, flaring environment, uh, we can have drastic consequences on Earth. And, and, and so astronomers have been keeping careful watch on the sun. And in recent years, of course, right now, it is sort of we, we have, we are approaching, maybe we have approached uh, the solar max, which is supposed to happen. And, you know, our predictions are still not perfect. So between 2024, 2025, and then getting into solar max zone is kind of taking us into that seasons of dangerous storms on the sun. And, and what happens during this phase of the cycle is that we have a greater frequency um, of such uh, violent uh, eruptions. So if you look at the sun in visible light, of course, it's dull, boring. But if you actually looked at the sun, the way we study them from space in soft X-ray, extreme ultraviolet rays, you will see the sun is dynamic, seething, bubbling, you know, like a boiling pot. And then there are these intense magnetic fields, you know, sort of um, jets of plasma, loops of plasma that rise and fall kind of along these uh, magnetic field lines, arches like raindrop in a way. It is kind of good to draw comparison with our own weather, even though everything on the sun is driven magnetically. So there is really, in terms of physics, no comparison. And, and, and sometimes such features can reach far into the corona and you can see them with different kind of wavelength. And, and then further out comes the very thin, poorly halo, the million plus degrees electrified gas, which, which we call plasma. And this is something, and this is the corona, the corona that you see behind me. My hair almost kind of looks that color these days. And this is something that you can see with naked eyes only during a total solar eclipse. And I'd be remiss not to mention that there is going to be a total solar eclipse visible on 8th of April if you are on the path of totality. And millions of Americans are on the path of totality. And you can easily take yourself there to see the totality. Seeing a partial eclipse and seeing a total solar eclipse, the difference is like night and day. That's all I can say. And I'd urge you to take yourself there because this is one of those opportunities. I think that leads a human being transformed, basically. Right now, what we are seeing are sort of the sunspots. You know, the sun is getting peppered with sunspots, which are this um, dark region. And they are dark only compared with the brightness of the disk around them, right? Um, but they actually, and they are dark because they have stronger, more intense magnetic fields underneath them, which really choke the flow of energy. And therefore, they are a little dimmer. And so the sun is going through its solar cycle every 11 years. And we are sort of in the peak of that cycle. And with sunspot numbers, as I mentioned, there will be more storms like solar flares, like coronal mass ejection. And that can really reverberate through the entire solar system. 
But we have missions like Solar Dynamics Observatory, like Stereo, like Solar Orbiter, like Parker Solar Probe, ACE, lots of these. They are actually keeping eye on the sun and telling us kind of where the sunspots are, where the active regions look really uh, threatening, basically. Now, when one of these flares uh, erupt or a coronal mass ejections happen, you know, it could be releasing as much energy as a billion hydrogen bombs. Now, again, don't quote me on that. I haven't done the calculation. But it is enough energy to power the whole world for 20,000 uh, years. So, I mean, just, just kind of keep some of this sort of immensity of what we are uh, dealing with. And with these explosions, there'll be huge amount of high energy particles, radiation in space and radiation from these storms is one of the major health threats that I uh, mentioned. And this is even more so when we go into deep space like the moon and like long voyage to Mars. And when we have these, this coronal mass ejection, this huge amount of plasma cloud, when it hits our planet, you know, its magnetosphere force uh, cushions the blow. And, but the high energy particles, depending on the orientation of the magnetic field of our own planet and the solar wind, they are funneled to the magnetic poles where they create these like unbelievable displays which are known as the Northern and Southern Lights. And they are coming with great frequency. And depending on the storms, they can go southward, where you know normally when it, it's extreme Northern latitudes and Southern latitudes, but then it can go equatorward. But they can, while this is beautiful display, and this kind of tells us when we see these lights, that a storm on the sun has made connection with our own environment. That is the connection, really. But this can also wreak electrical havoc, causing blackouts and you know blinding satellites and sensitive electronics. Um, uh, you know, national defense. I mean, you name it. You know, anything sort of that has a on-off switch is vulnerable to this activity, essentially. And, and that's what you're looking at. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, a flare can have impacts on technology that depends on Earth's ionosphere, right? Which is the electrically charged upper atmosphere, like high frequency radio used for navigation. Like I was I mean, giving you just a little bit more and then GPS, there are lots of kind of physical processes going on there. And, and when the first part, a burst of light from a flare reaches Earth, it can also cause surges of electricity and scintillation or flashes of light in the ionosphere, leading to radio signal blackouts, which just happened very recently on the daily side of uh, Earth uh, because we had some really powerful uh, storms. This can last for minutes uh, or in the worst cases, hours at a time. You know, living with a star is exciting, but I would say that it requires eternal vigilance for the in it, inevitable outbursts that I have talked about, but also during quiet conditions. Space weather never slows down. It just kind of changes form, basically. 